Hi, everyone. We're just going to give folks a couple more minutes to file in. Fontaine, are we ready to start? Up to you, saying you're hosting us. Please do start us off. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Singh. I am the National Field Director at APIA Vote. This is the first monthly survey of its kind, and this research will help inform us about what the API community stands stands on the most important issues of the day and would allow us better understand our communities in real time. Help us to, re and it'll help us to refine our outreach efforts. It'll help us <clears throat> help the general, sorry, <clears throat> the general public better understand AAPIs and hopefully improve political campaigns and parties engagement strategies within the AAPI community. We're truly happy to be here today with all our partners, uh, with our partners, A AAPI data and AAJA -A -A, and all of you here today. Thank you, Singh. Thank you so much, um, APIA Vote and AAJA, -A -A, um, for a continual partnership in hosting these briefings. Um, you know, just to introduce myself, I'm Fontaine Lowe, Deputy Director at AAPI Data. Um, I've been part of this data equity ecosystem for the past five years or perhaps career long as I've always longed for this kind of ongoing um, API perspective and experience um, to be infused to our public discourse. Um, Many of us have really dreamt of having this opportunity um, for, for many, many years and to see it come to fruition and in partnership with API Vote and AJ, um, it is such a pleasure. So um, thank you all for joining us. I love that I see a lot of familiar names on, uh, on the chat. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Karthik Ramakrishnan, our uh, director and founder at API Data. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fontaine, saying thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, welcome, everybody. We have a lot of data and insights to share with you today, uh, and we will have this available as a slide deck, as well as a recording available for all of you. Uh, we, we plan on having that up by Monday. Let's go to the next slide, please. So just to remind everyone about the uh, API data partnership with AP NORC. Um, let's go to the next slide. So API data, uh, if you don't know us by now, um, we've had uh, we've been around for 10 years, but really the people involved with API data, we have more than 15 years of survey research experience each, uh, including my colleague uh, Janelle Wong uh, in API communities. Uh, we also bring expertise in social science research and community engaged research. We think both of these are essential to produce actionable insights for our community. Uh, and that's really a big part of our focus. Our focus is on impact, uh, and we've been using our framework of DNA, data, narrative, and action for many years now. We're thrilled to be in partnership with very well-known names uh, in the fields of journalism and social science research, respectively. The Associated Press has longstanding expertise in data journalism, 
high trust and credibility across the country and wide reach through hundreds of local, state, and national publications. NORC at the University of Chicago is a global leader in objective nonpartisan research, stellar reputation in social science and survey methodology, uh, and has a longstanding strong partnership with the Associated Press on data-informed storytelling. Next slide. Now our work builds on critical data infrastructure called Amplify AAPI. API Data was an investor in the Amplify panel. Uh, AARP and NORC are the principals in, uh, in building out that infrastructure, and they are still looking for investors to increase the sample size uh, and also the geographic reach uh, of the sample uh, to grow it uh, in the months and years to come. Next slide. So just a little bit about Amplify. Think of that as the foundation on which these surveys are built. Uh, it's the largest, most representative public opinion panel of AA and HPIs. Um, and it allows for uh, surveys to be taken in uh, Asian languages with the largest need. So Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, and Vietnamese is designed to be representative of our populations, uh, including in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. U.S. households are randomly selected with a known non-zero probability uh, from the NORC national frame, as well as address-based sampling. Happy to talk about in the Q&A uh, for those who have more questions. In terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the sophistication, uh, we, we have 92% of households uh, being offered a language in which they're comfortable, and these surveys and recruitment strategies are designed to maximize engagement. Next slide. So here are some key findings. Uh, so the, this survey, so we had a prior survey that had some information about the candidates, uh, the presidential candidates. We encourage you to go to apidata.com slash surveys or to API votes uh, events pages to see um, those, those prior uh, surveys. This one that was just released earlier this week provides overall assessments about the US as well as views on democracy. So when you look at the overall uh, assessments of the U.S., only 12% say that democracy in the United States is working well. We also have the, the right direction, wrong direction question, and 81% of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders believe that the country is heading in the wrong direction. And these assessments are particularly high among AAPI Republicans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, Korean Americans, and people born in the U.S., in terms of political beliefs, about a half identify as Democrats, a quarter as Republican, and the rest independent. Um, this includes those who lean more towards one party versus uh, not leaning towards either party. Um, so, uh, so that's a, that's fairly stable there. Um, in terms of uh, President Biden's approval, this is different from candidate favorability. Uh, Forty-five percent of APIs approve of President Biden, which is higher than the general public at thirty-eight percent. 54% disapprove of Biden, which is lower than the general public at 61%. Uh, and then finally, Biden approval is particularly low among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders at only 22%. Next slide. In terms of views on democracy, 83% of APIs have concerns about misinformation in the U.S. election. This is a big deal. This is a very high number. And this surpasses concerns about voter suppression, which is still pretty high, 46%, limitations on free speech at 41%, and voter fraud, which is much lower at 31%. Concerns about misinformation are particularly high among Filipino and Korean Americans, uh, and they are high among Democrats and Republicans alike. And that's an interesting finding. Concerns about voter suppression are especially high among AAPI women, Japanese Americans, and Filipino Americans. Concern is very high among AAPI Democrats, 53% of it of whom say that it's a major problem. But AAPI Republicans are also concerned, 41%, compared to only 30% of Republicans in general across the country who are concerned about voter suppression. Now, you'll see the question wording later. Essentially, we talk about people who are eligible to vote not being able to vote. So that is an interesting difference among AAPI Republicans who seem to be more concerned about this issue than um, Republicans more generally in the country. Concerns about free speech, uh, limitations on free speech are especially high among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, Japanese and Korean Americans. Concern is higher among AAPI Republicans than AAPI Democrats, which makes sense given how this issue is playing out politically. 
And then finally, concerns about voter fraud are higher among NHPIs, AAPI Republicans, and AAPI 60 and older. Next slide. We also asked about where people view the parties on some of these issues, those related to democracy, as well as issues more generally. APIs rate uh, the Republican Party slightly higher on handling the economy than the Democratic Party, but they rate Democrats much higher than the Republican Party on college debt, as well as climate change. APIs rate uh, Democrats and Republicans about equally on immigration, and that's interesting because traditionally the Democratic Party has enjoyed a strong advantage on immigration within AAPI communities. On democracy-related matters, AAPIs rate Democrats much higher than Republicans. Looking within, when we disaggregate on handling the economy, the Republican Party holds the strongest advantage among Korean Americans, foreign-born adults, and males. And the Republican Party advantage is non-existent among Asian Indians, among AAPI women, and AAPI young adults. On handling climate change, the Democratic Party holds the strongest advantage among Indian Americans, those ages 18 to 29, and those who speak English at home. And we find those same patterns when it comes to handling student debt. Next slide. Finally, in terms of, uh, you know, what are some of the strongest predictors? Um, partisanship is the strongest predictor of divisions in AAPI opinion. You know, often we think of ethnicity as the most salient characteristic within our communities, and certainly it matters for things like socioeconomic status uh, and other indicators. Um, but uh, what we've seen in the past and we see here is that there's actually not as strong differences by ethnicity, uh, and they're not always consistent. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, you know, Asian Americans um, lean towards the Democratic Party, with the exception of Vietnamese Americans. And, you know, the Vietnamese American sample is not large enough or reliable enough uh, right now for us to be able to report on that. Um, but so, but partisanship ends up being a very strong predictor of divisions in AAPI opinion. So remember, about a half Democrat, a quarter Republican, and, and the rest independent. Partisan divisions are very strong with respect to views on the direction of the country and concerns about voter fraud and suppression of free speech. Uh, of course, Biden approval, as you might expect, strong partisan divisions. These partisan divisions are not as strong on concerns about voter suppression and misinformation. And that's something I think that's important to highlight, that these issues do not have a strong partisan divide in our communities. Ethnicity matters on several topics, but is not as strong nor as consistent across the board. Indian Americans tend to rate the Democratic Party higher on a range of issues than some other groups. Japanese and Americans and Filipino Americans show the strongest concerns about voter suppression, and Filipinos show the strongest concerns on misinformation, while Japanese Americans show the strongest concern about suppression of free speech. Divisions by age also emerge, and this is something that we want to pay attention to throughout this election year coming up. Um, but these divisions by age emerge on matters of public opinion, but again, they're not always consistent. 38% of those age 18 to 29 report that they trust neither party to handle the economy. Democrats hold a stronger advantage among 18 to 29-year-olds on student debt and climate change. And related to age, nativity also matters on several issues with native-born AAPIs more progressive on a range of issues. Next slide. So now we're going to go through a bunch of graphs and we're going to go through them pretty fast and we want to maximize time for Q&A. So let's go. Direction of the country. So generally speaking, uh, people feel that the country is headed in the wrong direction. And this is even higher among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Um, and it's also high among Korean Americans and Filipino Americans. Asian Indians are the ones least likely to say that the country is heading in the wrong direction, but even there you see close to 60% saying that it's heading in the wrong direction. Next slide. We see important differences by party ID, but look at that fact, even among AAPIs who identify as Democrat, 61% say that the country is heading in the wrong direction. So clearly it's not just about the incumbent that's at play, there are other factors at play. We also see age differences, but it doesn't always line up from youngest to oldest. Next slide. By the way, one quick thing I'll say is that uh, the youngest age group are the ones most likely to say that the country is heading in the wrong direction. 
perhaps reflective of what they see in terms of their economic and other prospects, um, potentially prospects for democracy. We also see some differences by nativity, but no strong gender differences. Next slide. Presidential approval. Let's go to the next slide. Um, in line with what we saw uh, last month in terms of uh, candidate favorability for Biden, we find that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders uh, rank lower than Asian Americans when it comes to Biden's approval. We also see some ethnic differences here, but given the sample sizes, uh, the ones likely to be statistically significant are between the top among Japanese Americans, uh, who a majority of whom give Biden uh, approval uh, as opposed to disapproval um, to Korean Americans at the bottom at 39%. Next slide. In terms of Biden presidential approval by party ID and age, familiar party differences. Uh, so that should not be surprising. Oh, my apologies. I have to mute my phone one second. Um, but let's go to the next slide. Um, and we don't see much in the way of, um, uh, of, of, of uh, differences by nativity. There are some gender differences with women, slightly higher approval than men. Next slide. In terms of problems related to democracy, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is something you'll find in the report from API Data and AP NORC. Uh, if you go to the AP NORC uh, website uh, and, and, and go to the API Data topic, and we will have it on our website uh, shortly as well. Um, but if you look at uh, the concerns related to democracy, we see that the spread of misinformation is very high. Um, much higher than other concerns. Uh, in terms of people eligible to vote and not being able to vote, there's a higher concern among Asian Americans uh, than in the rest of the population. Uh, we also see uh, efforts to limit free speech uh, as a significant concern, but not nearly as high as the spread of misinformation. And then finally, concerns about voter fraud, and we'll dig deeper there. Um, this is high among APIs who identify as Republican, um, as well as a few other groups, but it's not particularly high in general. Next slide. So misinformation, let's go to the next slide. Looking at divisions within the community, uh, you see that concerns are very high among Filipino Americans and Korean Americans, not as high among Pacific Islanders. Next slide. Uh, you see concerns uh, about misinformation uh, about on par, I mean, a little bit higher among Democrats than among Republicans. Um, but uh, statistically speaking, it's just, you know, I mean, essentially it, it is higher, but it's not a, it is not a huge difference. Uh, and this is something that's different, for, at least from what we're accustomed to expecting in the general population. We don't see major age differences as, as well in terms of concerns about misinformation, 80% or higher across groups. Next slide. And not much to see here in terms of either gender, language, or nativity differences. Next slide. Problem of voter suppression. So in terms of people who are eligible to vote not being allowed to vote, we see that it's seen as a significant concern uh, across the board. Um, and you see here that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, a majority of them see that as a major problem. There are some ethnic differences as well with Japanese Americans and Filipino Americans expressing strong concern here. Next slide. In terms of differences by age, there aren't many differences by age. There are partisan differences. Uh, although, as I said before, API Republicans rank this as a higher priority and a problem than Republicans overall in the general population. So 30% of the general population, 41% here, saying that this is a major problem. Next slide. Uh, in terms of other differences, the only difference that emerges that's interesting and significant are gender differences where API women are more likely than men to say that this is a major problem. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of the problem of free speech suppression. So how much of the problem are efforts to limit free speech? You see that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders uh, more so than Asian Americans say that this is a major problem. And you see that Japanese Americans and Korean Americans are more likely than, say, Asian Indians to say that this is a major problem. Next slide. Um, we see big differences by party here, where Republicans are, are much more likely than Democrats to say that this is a major problem. Next slide. 
Uh, and then finally, we see some differences here by nativity with the native born more likely to say uh, that this is a major problem than those who are foreign born. Next slide. Problem of voter fraud. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here uh, we see that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, more so than Asian Americans, say that this is a major problem, but it doesn't rise to a majority even among this group. Next slide. As I mentioned before, uh, this, here partisanship ends up being very strong uh, in terms of uh, concerns about voter fraud, which is people who are voting who are not eligible to vote. So this is a perception. Uh, I would say, rather than necessarily the reality of the extensiveness of voter fraud, which many studies show is fairly rare. Um, but we know that this is a, a, a this is an issue that divides partisans, uh, and it does so in our communities as well. We also see that those age 60 and over um, uh, are more likely to say that this is a major problem than those age 18 to 29, only 15% of which say that uh, voter fraud is a major problem in the United States. Next slide. And then finally, uh, we don't see much in the way of differences by nativity, language spoken at home, or gender. Next slide. We're going to run through this very quickly in terms of views of parties regarding the economy. Let's go to the next slide. So which uh, party is trusted to do a better job in handling the economy? Um, Republicans more so than Democrats, right? But it's not as strong of a, of a difference as we see in the general population. Um, next slide. We see big differences uh, based on if you're a Democrat or a Republican, and this might not come as a surprise. Um, and we also see big differences by age. So if you look at those 18 to 29 year olds, they're actually slightly more likely to say that Democrats are, are do a better job at handling the economy than Republicans. We also say the, in terms of the ones that say neither, we see that uh, younger folks are more likely to say that neither party uh, is doing a good job in handling the economy when compared to those age 60 and above. Next slide. Um, we see some differences by nativity here um, in terms of the foreign born giving the Republican Party uh, an advantage, whereas that advantage does not exist among the native born. We also see some gender differences where men are more likely to give the Republican Party uh, the advantage when it comes to handling the economy. Next slide. Climate change. So let's go to the next slide. Here uh, we see overall um, more likely to say the Democratic Party is doing a better job in handling climate change. Uh, we do see some variation between Pacific Islanders and Asian Americans there, and some variation between Korean Americans at the top, who are more likely to give credit to Republicans when compared to Asian Indians at the bottom. Next slide. Um, we see marginal differences. Uh, by um, by age here, although I guess on the Democratic side, it is a significant difference if you look at uh, those age 60 and over, for example, and those age 18 to 29. Partisanship, big, big difference here. So Democrats very likely to say that their party is doing a better job in handling climate change. Republican voters are about split. Um, in fact, and that's interesting as well. Uh, that they're about that they give uh, the Democratic Party about equal credit to the Republican Party in terms of handling climate change. Next slide. In terms of other differences, they're not uh, significant nor strong. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide. Student debt. So let's go to the next slide. In terms of which party can be trusted to do a better job in handling student debt, um, we don't see much differences in terms of race when it comes to ethnicity. A uh, slightly higher proportion of Filipinos say the Republican Party, uh, well, it's still a minority, right? Uh, mo across the board, we see that the Democratic Party has an advantage when it comes to student debt. Next slide. Bipartisanship, um, you know, Democrats, maybe not surprisingly, um, very likely to say that their party is doing a better job. Uh, Republicans uh, thinking their party is doing a better job. But even among Republicans, you see they say that both parties are doing it about equally. Um, we see big age differences here where 18 to 29 year olds are much more likely to give credit to the Democratic Party than to the Republican Party in terms of handling student debt. Next slide. In terms of uh, differences by nativity and language spoken at home and gender, we don't see uh, much in the way of statistically significant differences. Next slide. 
on immigration. Remember, I said earlier that um, the parties were not that far. I mean, voters, not voters, uh, API adults' perception of these parties are not as as um, as divergent as they might have been in the past. So yes, the Democratic Party uh, has a slight edge here, but it's not statistically significant. And if you look across groups, um, Asian Indians and Filipinos are the only ones that seem to be giving a greater nod to um, the Democratic Party than to the Republican Party. Next slide. We see some big party differences here. Uh, so those who identify as Democrat, more likely to say the Democratic Party is doing a good job. Among Republicans, Republicans say it's uh, Republican Party is doing uh, a better job. Independents are split. By age, we see that those age 60 and over are more likely to say that the Republican Party is doing a better job when compared to 18 to 29 year olds. They go the reverse, where they're more likely to say that Democrats are doing a better job. By the way, this is a big deal, folks. This is, I, I would say, as someone who has not only been studying our populations for as long as I have, but also immigration policy for as long as I have, the Democratic Party has lost ground when it comes to being seen as doing a better job in handling immigration among AAPI voters. Next slide. In terms of um, nativity, um, you see that um, among the foreign born, uh, a slight, uh, slightly more uh, than among the native born in terms of saying the Republican Party uh, is doing a better job and the foreign born are essentially split on this issue. Next slide. Finally, when it comes to democracy, so let's go. And so we'll do a lot here very quickly. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, the Republican Party is at a disadvantage across these issues. The Democratic Party holds the advantage when it comes to protecting free speech, protecting the integrity of voting in elections, ensuring that everyone who's eligible to vote is allowed to vote, and preventing the spread of misinformation. Next slide. So when you go deeper dive into misinformation, let's go to the next slide. Um, we see that um, you know across the board, the Democratic Party enjoys an advantage, uh, but that advantage is smaller among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Next slide. Um, we see partisan differences here again emerging, and then age differences emerge as well, um, with younger folks, 18 to 29, much, much more likely to say the Democratic Party is doing a better job in preventing the spread of misinformation. But even among those age 60 and over, uh, we see that they give the advantage to the Democratic Party. Next slide. Um, we don't see that much of difference when it comes to nativity, uh, language spoken at home, or gender uh, when it comes to Dem versus Republican uh, advantage in terms of handling the spread of misinformation. Next slide. Voting integrity. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of uh, preventing voter fraud and protecting the integrity of voting in elections, um, generally, the uh, Democratic Party enjoys an advantage across the board when it comes to race and ethnicity. Let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, partisanship uh, emerges here. So Repo API Republicans are more likely to say the Republican Party is doing a better job whereas Democrats are more likely to say that Democrats are doing a better job. Independents are more likely to say that Democrats over Republicans, but it's not as strong as among Democrats. Um, we see some significant age differences here, where those in the youngest age bracket are more likely to give credit to Democrats versus Republicans than among those age 60 and over when it comes to protecting the integrity of voting in elections. Next slide. We don't see that much of a difference when it comes to nativity, language spoken at home, or gender, but we're gonna put all these slides up so that people have the data points that they can use in their news stories, or if you're a community organization and the kind of planning that you're doing in the year coming up. Next slide. So voter access, let's go to the next slide. So ensuring that everyone who's eligible to vote is allowed to vote, Democratic Party enjoys the advantage across groups when it comes to race and ethnicity. Uh, and a stronger, strongest advantage among Indian Americans, but really an advantage everywhere. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of uh, differences by nativity, um, we don't see, uh, and language spoken at home and gender, we don't see much in the way of differences. And let's go to the next slide. By party ID, uh, we see that familiar partisanship pattern where Democrats trust, uh, is, is say the Democratic Party is doing a better job, Republicans say the Republican Party is doing a better job. 
Uh, and again, we see important age differences uh, with uh, those in the youngest age demographic more likely to say that the Democrats are doing a better job at um, uh, ensuring that everyone who's eligible to vote is allowed to vote when compared to the oldest demographic. But even among those age 60 and over, we see that the Democratic Party enjoys an advantage over the Republican Party. Next slide. Finally, in terms of free speech, let's go to the next slide. Um, generally speaking, people trust the Democratic Party to do a better job at protecting free speech. Um, and this is across the board, right? So that pattern that we've seen with Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, where they might have been giving the advantage to the Republican Party on issues like the economy and a few other issues, we don't see that here. Um, let's go to the next slide. Again, we see some party differences uh, that emerge in terms of who's doing a better job in protecting free speech. Um, and we also see age differences with those in the youngest demographic, much more likely to say Democrats versus Republicans in terms of doing a better job in protecting free speech. I believe we're at the end. Oh, uh, yeah, not much differences by, um, by nativity or gender or language spoken at home. Um, although with those is where English is the only language spoken at home, you see a, a stronger advantage there in terms of trusting the Democratic Party in protecting free speech. I think that's it. Let's go to the next slide. Yes. So we are now at Q&A and I'll turn it over to my colleague and partner, Naomi Takuyan Underwood from AJ. Hello, everyone. I'm Naomi Takuyan Underwood, Executive Director of AJA. Um, Karthik, that, that was a lot to unpack. Um, we're so glad to be partnering with API Vote and API Data on this because one of our one of our strategic priorities at AJA is to really bring journalists closer to this kind of data and research and make sure um, that our journalists are media leaders in terms of being able to utilize this and explain um, and represent our API communities better to their newsrooms and um, media entities. So um, I think there was a question about this in the chat. So we're just gonna go through the chat, but I also have questions um, sort of like, let's pull back a little bit. That was a lot of data. Karthik, could you talk over time? I remember the first Asian American survey was in 2008. Somebody had asked about trends. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. There's also um, somebody wondering about the Biden approval rating being different if if this had been taken or in the field before the war in Israel. But could you take us back to 2008 and over time and over cycles, talk about um, any trends and differences that you have observed sure. and are paying attention to going yeah. into 2024? Thank you, Naomi. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that people may or may not know when it comes to um, Asian American voters, at the very least, you know, Pacific Islander surveys have been rare, and we're so thrilled that we were able to to be able to do this. Um, but when it comes to Asian American voters, between 1992 and 2012, they had the most dramatic shift from supporting the Republican Party for president in 1992 to being among the strongest supporters of Barack Obama in 2012. Um, and by the way, historically. There are very few groups in American history in the course of 20 years that had that dramatic of a shift. Um, and so part of it is to based on what the Democratic Party did in the 1990s uh, under the Clinton administration and many people, early elected officials, um, you know, pioneers, if you will, uh, or like early, uh, early successes on the Democratic side when it came to representation. And then post 9-11, uh, the Republican Party and its stances on immigration um, and and also the rise of Christian conservatism in the Republican Party really pushed a lot of Asian Americans away from the Republican Party. So that's kind of that much larger sweep. Um, so when it comes to, uh, so that's on, you know, candidate choice. And we saw that Asian Americans, you know, depending on the poll, two thirds to 70% voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016 and voted for Biden in 2020. Partisanship is so strong. I know we'd say that the Asian American vote and the APIs are persuadable. It is true because especially Asian Americans, most of them are naturalized citizens in terms of who who's in the electorate. They didn't grow up as a Republican or Democrat, um, but our community has been stepping up and voting for several cycles now. And the research shows that the the more you vote and the more you vote consistently, 
that ends up being a pattern and a habit. So I, if I had to predict in terms of what's going to happen when it comes to election day, chances are that people will kind of return to their party groups. There's still a lot more to unpack, and we will over the next several months, adding questions about reproductive rights, for example. What kind of influence will that have? Gun control. So there are many other issues we need to start paying attention to beyond presidential approval in terms of what this might mean in the coming year. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to I want to go back to this high rate of respondents talking about the country going in the wrong direction, because because that's a that's a point of concern for people working on civic engagement um, and anyone working on democratic participation. But just to go back really quickly in terms of this trend, but but the fact that respondents on um, immigration are now perceiving that Democrats have 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 are not the best party to handle They've that. They've lost their advantage, yeah. Right. I mean, the last two times a policy window was even possible for immigration reform, um, Democrats had championed those uh, those comprehensive immigration reform bills. Um, do we see that anywhere else? Is it is it just because of the fact that the, there can be no middle ground found? There is no compromise in policy land, and this is going to have repercussions into sort of political participation. Yeah, the thing when you see on issues like immigration, for example, you have you you among especially among Democratic voters, you have frustration that maybe the party is not being bold enough and doing enough. Among independents, you have the sense that, you know, you have a Democratic president in charge and yet immigration is not being solved either in terms of legalization or in terms of border control. Right. And on the Republican side, that disapproval of 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 Biden, uh, right, and as well as if later in other surveys when we've dug deeper into immigration, it's more of a concern about lack of uh, seriousness about border control. So it's a complicated issue um, where you know progressive frustration on immigration is that they're not going far enough in terms of uh, trying to push for legalization or trying to be more progressive on immigration. I think the economy is interesting too, Naomi, because that's something where you think the Republican Party would have a stronger advantage than it would. I mean, certainly the Republican Party enjoys a strong advantage in the general electorate, uh, but that advantage is not as strong in API communities. Thanks for that assessment. Oh, and then finally I'll say, and then maybe Seng can jump in when you ask about civic engagement. You know, yeah. I think part of the thing is like thinking about the country's heading in the wrong direction yeah. It could either demobilize people or motivate them and mobilize them. Um, and I think that what's important here, a lot yeah. of times in the past, people thought wrong direction is usually an, an indictment on the incumbent president. But there's so much polarization and so much tension and conflict politically and policy-wise going on in our country. That wrong direction measure, I'm not sure if it necessarily means that it's going to be a vote against the incumbent, because there's a lot to unpack there. And I don't want to speak for API vote, but hopefully, um, you know, seeing that things are heading in the wrong direction can be a motivator to participate rather than uh, a demobilizer or demotivator. Yes, that was going to be my question around wrong direction is what is the challenge and what is the opportunity in terms of the strategies of mobilizing voters, right? Um, a quick data question here from Eric Salcedo. Will there be state crosstabs? So we, uh, if you go to, and uh, you know, I'm gonna drop this in the chat. We should have put it up on our website, but if you go even to our website, if you go to that AP NORC page, um, you will see basically we only have enough data for California versus the rest of the country right now. So API data, we invested in the data infrastructure to really increase the size of that California sample um, to be able to say more about California versus uh, the rest of the country. For other states, um, the, the panel doesn't have large enough sample, unfortunately. So this would be a call for investors to invest more in that sample, because once you build out that panel, it makes surveys like this much, much easier to do and much less expensive to do. Yes. Um, 
I, I wanted to ask, you know, what's what what was really startling to me that I didn't think would be that high would be the rate of respondents who believe misinformation is a real issue. Um, we have journalists on this webinar. We have foundation funders on this webinar and many in our nonprofit and civic engagement space. And that is a concern for everyone in terms of uh, the impact and how much of a chaos agent that can be in in. In, in the work of informing and educating voters. Um, as a Filipina with immigrant with lived experiences, I, I can actually relate to how Filipinos have a slightly higher rate given that um, in the Philippines, our own elections and democratic processes have been affected um, by misinformation and disinformation. But I'd love to know more of your thoughts on that high rate um, and what's the work ahead, right, for, for API Vote, for folks on the call, in terms of misinformation being such a disruptor of democracy? Yeah, I, I, I you know, I think especially if, not just for journalists, but also um, people in philanthropy and community, this is a big flashing warning sign, right? Um, misinformation, and I'll say as someone, so not only do I do survey research, I'm a political scientist by training, I actually started off grad school studying comparative politics, uh, politics across different countries. Um, when people feel that the information that they're getting is suspect or they're cautious about that, um, that is a that is a warning sign. Um, and so that's something, I, and this is where I think journalism comes in too, Naomi, right? And like in terms of what role can journalism play, especially journalism that has credibility within our communities. Um, and I know that we're going to be partnering uh, for future studies to really dig deeper into this question. Okay, we're seeing that misinformation. By the way, it's even Republicans that are concerned about it, right? So it's not right. being seen right. of false information or misinformation. I think that was also important, the way we worded that question. Misinformation sometimes is uh, seen as a technical term, or maybe progressives use that. But when you say false information, right, you see all these allegations about fake news and false information. So what can we do to at least start figuring out what is a common set of facts that we can agree on? And especially when it comes to things that have significant bearing on the future of our democracy and on some of these issues where there very clearly are facts in addition to opinions on an issue. Um, so this is this is a kind of major area of concern. A colleague of mine, Jonathan Methestein, he's uh, Asian American. He heads California Common Cause. They have started a new venture called Cited. I believe it's Cited.tech. I believe it's a website. If you go to California Common Cause, you can see it. They are focusing on the use of artificial intelligence to amplify misinformation and disinformation uh, in general, but especially in 2024. This is something we all need to pay attention to. It is a big deal. Um, and, and you're right. It is something that is not confined to the U.S. It is happening throughout the world right now. Yes. And, and a quick preview. I think Karthik was giving a preview of things to come is that we are we are collaborating the three organizations into delving on this more in terms of the fact that uh, there is there has trust in mainstream American media institutions has declined over time. And, um, you know, our community, our Asian American community media, whether English or in language, has really been uh, one of the, the more reliable sources of information that's actionable for our community. Um, just to address the, the question in the chat about differences in news consumption habits, we are going to go into that. Um, were they consuming news on American politics from their home countries as opposed to mainstream U.S. news? You know, I think when in, when we ad, when AJ advocate, advocates for the API community and investing more in AAPI audiences, that is one of the points that we make. That um, for us, news is not local. Uh, we are not local news consumers. Versus the fact that generally our households consume news locally. We pay attention to national news, and someone in our household is paying paying attention um, to international news or news from our homelands, and that's really important in terms of reporting and contextualization and also civic engagement strategies as well. So more to come on that because we do want to make sure that in the body of research out there about trust, news, democracy, and civic engagement, that there are um, more and more AAPI specific data points uh, that can be reported on and that can be used 
um, in civic engagement. I'm going to turn yeah. quickly over to a question going back to a spe specific policies. Um, John Trisvenia is asking, many attribute record levels of anti-Asian hate and violence to political statements and policy on China. Will, will there be efforts to survey how AAPIs view the parties on trust or effectiveness on foreign policy? Great. Thank you, Naomi. We also see a question in the chat that's very relevant to the questions that we are developing for our future survey when it comes to the kind of new resources uh, that people are consuming. Um, we we are, so not in this survey, John, but in, in future surveys, we do. Uh, first, we are going to be paying attention. Some of this is about news consumption. How much news are they, how much attention are they paying to U.S. foreign policy and also politics in their homelands? So like, so we want to first get that and then where they see um, the parties uh, and perhaps even in particular, uh, as we head to the election and the presidential election, um, you know, with Joe Biden and then whoever emerges from the Republican side, um, where they see on those issues. I would just say, putting some of the pieces together between 2016 and 2020, what was interesting when we looked at the Asian American voter survey is that Donald Trump lost support among Chinese Americans between 2016 and 2020. So a lot of that anti-China rhetoric might have played a role in that shift. Trump gained support among um, Indian Americans during that time. He still lost the Indian American vote um, by pretty large margin, uh, but it's possible that foreign policy uh, played a difference there. The interesting thing is whenever we ask people, what are the most important issues to you? Foreign policy doesn't appear at the top of that list, but it sounds like it might be making a difference at the margins, or it's not necessarily in a top of the mind issue, but it might make a difference in terms of shifts over time uh, in terms of what foreign policy means. Right. And and Karthik, it, it may not be that foreign policy is the way our communities think about it versus really being sort of part and parcel to being a global citizen and 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 world views, right? Um, but that's that's certainly something we have to keep in mind as we have been encouraging and educating newsrooms um, about uh, being very intentional with language uh, and how they attribute um, terminology to governments versus individuals and that kind of harmful impact. So um, I'm glad. I think that will be a through line going into 2024 as well. Um, we have, we're a little bit over time, but just want to make room for any final questions. Um, I know the API data team will be following up with uh, the deck, as well as if you have any questions specific to the survey itself, um, you're in great hands with the API data team, but any yeah. final questions? Oh, here. Well, another, and someone in the Q&A had asked about uh, the, I will just, it is cited, C-I-T-E-D dot tech. And that's C-I-T-E-D stands for California Initiative for Technology and Democracy. Um, but I think a lot of the insights they gained there will certainly apply in the rest of the country. And Jonathan Mehta Stein is, uh, if, you, if you haven't, he used to be at uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus strong champion of language access and voting rights, and now is heading up California Common Cause. And this is, a, this is an important effort, but I would say even on something like that, it's one thing to pay attention to what's happening on uh, platforms like Facebook, like Twitter, but who's paying attention to what's happening on WeChat? Who's paying attention to what's happening? WhatsApp is something that's really hard to, it's not quite the same kind of tracking mechanism. And we know that our communities use WhatsApp, Kakao, WeChat. Uh, and so that's something that I think is important as we think through um, misinformation um, and how it can play out through social media. And then now to think about the potential for artificial intelligence and deep fake technology uh, to make it worse. Right. And on the flip side of that, you know, how do we strengthen our trusted messengers mechanism? How do we restore faith in right. newsrooms and trusted media sources? Um, what is the media literacy plan? Because that media literacy, I mean, it's coming at the tail end of our conversation here, but it undergirds having an informed and engaged uh, voter, right? Um, in terms of being able to utilize media to make decisions uh, for your household, for voting, um, for participating. Um, but we yeah, are- I'll are just say a quick, couple of quick things on that, Naomi. I wrote a piece yeah. a while ago and I'm happy to share that later. Is like, if we think about- uh, 
exactly to your point. We think about misinformation. It's kind of like if your garden is overrun with weeds. Yes, we need to remove all the weeds. But what are the plants that you're going to plant? Like, what are the good things that you're going to do? Right. Or another right. analogy. A lot of people say it's like, OK, don't eat junk food. It's like, OK, like we know what not to do, but we need to invest in nutritional food options in communities, too. Right. It's not just about taking things away, but what are we proactively investing in so that people make better decisions? And on that note, we can end there. We look forward to following up with you with the deck. Uh, there is certainly a lot, and and we hope that you can take these back to your organizations and to your newsrooms, and this fuels additional conversation, additional dialogue, additional questions, um, and actionable items. Um, you know, going going into 2024. And I believe this is the last briefing of the year, but we look forward to Fontaine, can you give us a little bit of a preview about the survey? Oh, and let me let me also just say the one one important question in the chat. And I'll read sure. it out. Uh, it says curious to know if the survey um was inclusive to the API LGBTQ community because some API LGBTQ community that don't identify as male or female will make them feel like they don't want to take the survey. And that's leaving out other API communities. Fully agree with you, Monica. Um, so we people are able to choose other gender categories. When it comes to weighting the data, though, mm -hmm. there is no population frame right now to know uh, what to weight it to. And these are weighted data. And we've asked uh, NORC, uh, and who, who are like at the cutting edge of social science methodology. Uh, but right now, that is not possible um, to be able to do that. And even so, the sample size is given the size of the survey. It's not something where we can report at the point estimate. But people are able to take the survey if they don't identify as male or female. So I just want to provide reassurance on that account. Right. And to Karthik's earlier points, I believe he mentioned it twice, thus the importance of investing in Amplify AAPI. So if anyone is interested, I myself as AJA, we are just getting to know the limitations, the opportunities here, but I believe there's always an opportunity to expand um, incrementally. I think um, that they are very, very open to it. Um, so to the extent where more investments can be made, uh, the sample size gets stronger and there's more detail that can be extracted. And then I will turn it over to Fontaine. This is the December briefing. I know there's something out in the field. Fontaine, could you give a quick preview for folks for what's to come for the January briefing? Hi, everyone. I mean, I think that um, Karthik might be better just to kind of speak to it. But we did have a, have a question um, in the Q&A about, you know, do we, can we get an understanding of, you know, how folks are prioritizing some of these issues relative to one another? Um, and I did mention that, you know, there was data collected, but it is uh, open response. So it will just, uh, it's not included in today. Um, but in January, please do stay tuned as that will be part of um the data available then. Uh, Karthik, I don't know if you want to share any further. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, first of all, so we, there are like so many big deals about the work that we're doing. I'm, I'm like very excited about this as a researcher, but I think all of us should get excited about it because we will have, we will know people in their own words, what they care about. It's going to get recoded, but often I get frustrated sometimes. You might too, when you say economy and the job, e economy and jobs, that's usually the top issue no matter what year you survey people, it's always about the economy and jobs. It's like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, so we'll get to be able to dig into some of the nuances, I'm hoping, um, in order to be able to do that. Um, and uh, we'll have more uh, on democracy related uh, topics in, in January. And then we're going to take a pause. But Naomi, I'm hoping that by February, we'll have things to report from our uh, studies as well. But we, in terms of the roadmap, we're looking at issues like for, you know, in, in 2024, we're, we're exploring issues like reproductive rights and abortion, depending on how you want to frame that issue up. Gun control, environment, you know, we want to be ready for Earth Day to know where Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders stand on various types of environment related opinions. And then education. We're going to be coming up to the one year anniversary of the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, but that's not the only education agenda issue in our community. So we know that when it comes to the quality of public education, education access, student debt, these are all significant concerns. 
bullying in schools. So these are all things we'll be di diving deeper into in the months to come. Oh, you're muted, Naomi. And with that, thank you so much for taking the time today to attend the briefing. And on behalf of the collaborative, we wish you a happy holiday season. Thank you, everybody.